everybody. How many of you were there last night? A lot of you. Almost all of you. If so, if you weren't there last night, um, so I was expecting, I was instructed <laughs> that most people would be fresh. So I had a little, I have a little review of what I went through last night. But I think, well, I'm going to go through it so fast that um, you won't be bored. But really, what I want to talk about tonight is a real stress on the, the, last, four, the last two categories um, of what makes for a walkable place, which is a, the comfortable walk and the interesting walk, um, and focusing less on the other two categories, which are the reason to walk and the safe walk. But let's quickly go through. Um, we talked about, this is all going to be in the past, this will be very meta. I'm going to talk about talking to you. But we talked about the two models of sprawl versus traditional planning and mixed use, the traditional neighborhood versus sprawl and how they're different. And I stressed this diagram, which you should study. Talked about how downtown there's a lot of, in red, a lot of parking decks that aren't being fully utilized and a lot of missing teeth that could take new buildings that would be served by those parking decks. Then moving into the safe walk, quickly marched through all the pedestrian and bicyclist um, crashes that are happening in your downtown. It's a lot. Uh, you know, I look at these for all the cities that I visit. They're usually about five years, and they don't usually look this. This is a five-year map. They usually don't look this bad. Um, the, the, the importance of speed and then all the factors that contribute to the speed of the vehicle, the first one being multi-lane, one-way streets, and how bringing two ways back has proven to be really good for business. You have a lot of these. I won't name them all. You know them. Uh, they, they're throughout your map. Um, I showed briefly Cedar Rapids, which we turned from a half four-lane, one-way system to a almost all two-lane, two-way system so that streets went from this to this. And then the next item after one way is just the number of lanes in the street, as already alluded to. This is Oklahoma City. Knowing that a typical two-lane road without turn lanes is all you need for 10,000 cars a day or so, and observing in Oklahoma City that they had car counts in the five to 8,000 on these streets that were four to six lanes wide, that we, we re, uh, unlike in Cedar Rapids where we did just, just with paint, and that's what I recommend to most cities, they actually had $200 million to spend, so we rebuilt almost all of these streets. Um, here's another <coughs> four lane one way, two lane two way, I forgot to mention the the, the tram track that's also a part of that street. Um, and then looking at your downtown grid, and you know, the red streets are getting more than, roughly more than, you know, maybe 12 to 15,000 cars per day or more. The yellow streets are closer to 10. Uh, the green streets are considerably less, and the white streets are even less than less. And observing a couple things. The first is that going street by street, there's a lot of streets here that can lose lanes. But more importantly, and what's my great frustration with DOTs, is they refuse to look at the system as a system. And it's, it's a capillary, porous network where every driver is an individual intelligent actor who can make the choice to go left or right if they see a backup in front of them. And the idea that certain streets have to handle all the traffic is actually a very suburban model that has no place in downtowns. So what, you, what, what I started to do, because I kind of I kind of forgot. What I started to do was say, OK, the red street can become three lanes, and the yellow streets can become two lanes, maybe with a little turn lane at the intersection, and the rest of the streets can be two lane. But then I remembered, no, all these streets can be two lane. Because if you, if you average the trips across the network, you're probably averaging maybe 6,000 trips a day on every street. And it should naturally be distributed lightly through the whole network. So every street is safe, but also observed. Every street has the safety of eyes on the street, which these days tends to be drivers, right, moving slowly through the downtown. So these are imminently fixable. Um, I talked about signals versus stop signs and how stop signs dramatically improve, always stop signs, dramatically improve the safety of intersections. And many plans I've done where we turn signals into stop signs and how that causes greater safety but also less traffic. Because no one's sitting there. You can get through the downtown faster when you never have to sit at a light. The width of the lanes is the next item. Uh, you've, you've got a 12-foot standard 
in your city. Don't feel bad, a lot of Western cities do. The standard used to be 10 and it is 10 again. And a 10 foot lane, you know, it might be a 40 mile an hour lane, but a 12 foot lane is a 70 mile an hour lane. And drivers know that intuitively, so you want to have lanes as narrow as possible. Parallel parking, the essential barrier of steel that protects the curb from moving vehicles. You're allowed to park here in Fort Lauderdale, you're not allowed to park there. Here's the parked side, here's the unparked side. Trees, the other part of the picture, protect you from speedy cars and trucks. And then, of course, it's a little harder to grow trees here than in other places, but um, they do grow. And you need to, they don't grow if you don't plant them. <laughs> um, the, the new evolution in bike facilities, that you won't get a large biking population unless those are protected, potentially by parked cars, which takes a lane out of the street as here in Prospect Park West in, in New York City. And the experience of a protected bike lane, which, which actually creates a cycling culture, as opposed to the door zone bike lane, um, which doesn't, and is often used for other things. Uh, Sharrows have been shown to actually increase danger in streets, so we replace them with the Prero. In other words, don't use Sharrows. Um, and then we, we're now using a European model in the new places we build. This is in Somerville, Massachusetts, but Somerville, Cambridge, I'm doing a project in, New in Newton, did a project in Indiana where this is the new standard, curb, bike lane, separator, pedestrian. That's, the, that's what we should be doing everywhere when you rebuild a sidewalk. Uh, and so now I'm going to get into the fun part, the more design-oriented part, the more architectural part, the comfortable walk, I spoke last night about how all animals seek prospect and refuge. And if your flanks don't feel covered, you don't feel comfortable in a space. And great space making is about, I should say great, great place making is about space making. And the term that we've been using for years, outdoor living room, really means it. Like, do you feel enclosed? Do you feel safe? And, and so, you know, what's the ideal? Oh, and I, this is for this crowd, not last night, but this crowd needs to see the the similarities in great spaces. Let's do that again, it's so much fun. And of course the Salk Institute is, is um, timeless in so many ways, but Louis Kahn understood what made a great, a great space. So you know the ideal one to one ratio, beyond six to one, unless you have trees necking the space down, beyond six to one you really don't feel enclosed anymore. And I have all these pictures, just all, oh and also, even an ideal sidewalk puts the sidewalk dining on the outside as well as the inside so that you're, you have that feeling of enclosed space between the diners. And uh, a friend of mine took this joke wedding photo, right? People always pose in beautiful landscapes. But his point was in the suburban zone with the higher than six to one ratio, this is pretty nice sprawl, right? It's not bad looking, but it really doesn't work. Um, but what does work? You know, Salzburg, I showed Houston in the 1980s is the opposite of Salzburg. And just avoiding that exposure to surface parking lots that create that feeling of a vast wasteland, in addition to being boring. And your best spatial definition even has a roof on it. Um, and how that falls apart with these, these missing teeth. Fortunately, you don't have too many in the downtown. Now, for this sophisticated crowd this morning, I decided to show this building, which just cracked me up. I think the guy had a May line that only went up and down. But he, uh, I'm not sure, I, this was probably some quest for solar access. Like somehow, south, due south is better than southeast. Southeast is actually better than south. But, um, but what happens, of course, particularly with the parking lot in front, um, is that you begin to lose that sense of definition. Um, and then last night I picked on this building for not pulling up to the street. You know, in an urban downtown, you know, I don't know what this, is, this feels like, but it does not feel like a city. And there's no reason, you know, your code should be asking new buildings to pull up to the sidewalk, not just with little, you know, outhouses, but the whole, the whole building. Um, so let's talk a little bit about placemaking and you know, I think, as you'll see if I get to it, when, when, when I do architecture, I like to do modern architecture. I prefer, I prefer doing it myself. And, you know, honestly, the amount of light and air and 
um, cleanliness that you can get with a great modern building. I prefer to a traditional building to live in. But m most urban thinkers feel that modernist planning as opposed to modernist architecture was just a big mistake. It was a 50-year error. Um, traditional urban planning and traditional urban fabric is about buildings take whatever, taking whatever expedient shape they need to in order to shape public spaces that are well formed. Um, the object is the space, not the building, with certain exceptions like monuments and civic buildings. Modernist urban fabric is about the building as the object. So what are you shaping? Are you shaping the space or are you shaping the building? Is the building meant to be this um, sculpture that you can see from all directions? And Gropius even talked about the, the landscape shaped by the automobile as, as, a, as a new ideal and that it had a dynamic <coughs> sense of motion by being able to observe buildings from every side. But what it doesn't do is, is shape space properly. And then, of course, there's the whole um, object fixation we have with uh, creating unusual <laughs> buildings. Um, but there is a place for that for monuments. And, and as a monument, this I was, I was just here two days ago. Um, you can't even take the elevator up anymore because everyone's fleeing themselves off of it. But the, the, um, there's a place for monuments. But this sort of thinking can't be allowed to impact the fabric of our cities. And if you think about all the places you like to spend time, if I'm guessing accurately about where you like to spend time, it's remarkable, actually, how little public space there is as a percentage, um, if you add up all the streets and squares, but also how beautifully shaped those public spaces are. And I lived in Florence for two years. Um, but there's so many great ones. Probably the most extreme example of this, I haven't been here, but who knows where this is? Anybody? This is Madrid. And they literally went into the medieval fabric, kind of a house mini move, right? But not plowing boulevards through, they plowed a, a living room into the medieval fabric of Madrid. You can see they just built, they, they crushed whatever was in this zone. <laughs> and then they put in this uniform facade around a beautiful pavement. I have to go here. Don't we, all, we all have to go here now. This is amazing. But that's what makes great places. And I just have image after image, just you know, travel pictures. Some aren't mine, some are from magazines. But all over the world, you know, from Eastern Europe to, uh, to right near where I live, Beacon Hill, and Burlington, Vermont. And this is a project I worked on, um, a DPZ project um, in, North in South Carolina. This is Rosemary Beach, a project I designed in Florida. Um, I did not design this project. <laughs> but just how spaces have walls. This is just a typical square in uh, Bari in Italy. It's, it's an outdoor living room. Wedge-shaped spaces are really the best. Um, greenery as a roof is a fantastic addition. Northern Europe, Southern Europe. This is one of my favorite streets. It's in Warsaw. And it's kind of hard to see, but someone went in with like a three mile radius. Someone went in, you know, in the 19th century, I believe, and created this incredibly long curve that's perfect. It's absolutely consistent. And created this experience of a street in Warsaw that closes the space down. But my favorite spaces of all are, are triangular. And I try to put these in plans whenever I can. This is Place des Vosges in, no, Place Dauphin in Paris. Um, this is Kentlands in DC, which I worked on, triangular spa shaped space. And so people get it wrong. And this is a, just something I spotted in an architecture magazine a couple years ago. But there's still this beautiful graphic form making, or I should say composition, but a lack of understanding about how spaces bleed um, and buildings kind of still as objects. And one of the best examples is this new square that was planned in, in Illinois, in Munster, sorry, Munster, Indiana. And the model was Lake Forest, Illinois. And what you have in Lake Forest, Illinois, you can see is some streets that run north-south and then a oval-ended uh, an actual cir uh, circle ended town square in the middle. And it's surrounded by buildings. And if you've been to Lake Forest or in the area, you know this is a place where everyone wants to go and hang out. It's a great little social space. It's a suburban center. And so here's our project 
in Munster, Indiana, which is copying Lake Forest. And they've got the town hall square and the streets running through, but absolute lack of spatial definition on either side of that space. This will not read as a space. It's just going to be a piece of grass in a parking lot. And that's something people still get wrong. Oh, here they are side by side. And then a wonderful project that you may know from Columbus, uh, Indiana, sorry, Col Columbus, Ohio, um, where this was the bridge across the highway between two neighborhoods, the convention center neighborhood, which had a ton of people in it, and the short north neighborhood, which was struggling. It was a struggling ethnic neighborhood. This was the short north, the convention center was over here. They had to rebuild the bridge, the, the state highway department did, and the city gave them, I think, an extra $2 million to make the deck bigger, and they just gave the deck to an architect, or to a developer, who brought in his architect. Here's the convention center neighborhood. I think Eisenman had something to do with this. Um, here's the short north. And now the experience of crossing the highway is seamless. And no one was crossing the highway. This little building, you know, cost a couple million dollars. Restaurants and just restaurants. I don't even think there's any shops in it. This one building turned the short north into the hottest neighborhood. Now you can't, you can't afford it anymore. So it, it, it completely transformed a whole neighborhood just by closing that gap. And then still in Canada or Britain or anywhere in the US, you know, new town center, <laughs> you know, why haven't we learned this yet? You know, if it's a parking lot in the heart, it is not, it is not a center. So um, next, I want to talk about shadows. Um, the New Yorker magazine has a cartoon contest every week where you're supposed to guess the caption. I have a lot of fun with those. This did not win. <laughs> but it was one of several. My other said, like, me think not in neighborhood character. That was the other one I had. <laughs> um, but shadows have had a huge impact. I think misunderstanding of the value of shadows, especially as the planet gets hotter, um, have really been destructive to urbanism. Going back to, you know, the very first access to light studies of Hilbersheimer and others, which led to the kind of dissipation of the city. These are not bad projects, these lower ones, um, but they forget about the need to shape space. And then, of course, when this strategy invaded um, American cities, like you have here on the, on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, um, you know, thank goodness for the trees. And this isn't a bad, you know, this isn't a bad environment. It's just not an urban environment. It's not an environment that's likely to get you out and about as much as a more traditionally well-shaped space. And I have all these pictures of people enjoying shadows. In a lot of places where I work, you need to do a shadow study um, to create shadows, not to hide away from shadows. But my absolute favorite, and I get most of my pictures these days off of Twitter, my absolute favorite is this situation. You want to see something funny? Some Upper East Side NIMBYs are holding a Stop the Tower rally against the New York Blood Center project right now. In 88 degree weather, in the sun, save our light signs. You'll never guess where half the rally attendees are. <laughs> and they're all hiding in the shadows. And um, these guys are just obviously not very comfortable. Um, but what would really make a big difference is, is trees. And the uh, fight for light, they say in the shade. Um, street trees absolutely transform places. And we do not begin to understand. We're, we're just, I don't, I don't know if you've read much of the recent literature, the, the overstory by Richard Powers and other great um, novels and nonfiction information about all the things that trees do. But we don't understand all the things that trees do um, beyond just providing shade. Um, what if I told you that a high number of streets close to the home is related to lower numbers of local prescriptions for antidepressants, even when controlling for a wide range of factors, such as deprivation? You wouldn't believe me, but it's true. These are all these, all these studies zero out. You have to be very careful whenever you look at a study by yourself or someone else. Think about income and make sure it's being zeroed out. Because a lot of good things just correlate with income, because people with income move to better places, right? So you've got to make sure that's zeroed out. These studies zero that out. What if I told you it's shown for every 10% increase in urban canopy cover, there's a 15% decrease in violent crime and a 14% decrease in property crime? 
it's amazing the data that I've learned so much uh, about. And the reason I've learned so much in the last year is that two year, almost two years ago on August 10th, in one hour, the city of Cedar Rapids, Iowa, lost two thirds of their tree canopy. They lost 690,000 trees, the worst urban storm event, tree loss event in American history. Um, it was called a derecho, a straight wind storm, 140 mile an hour gusts through, their, through the heart of their city. No one got hit harder. 12 semis flipped. You can see what it did. Um, but uh, I had done, I showed you that street, a street plan I did for Cedar Rapids that they were really happy with. So they called me back like 10 years later and said, will you, will you um, lead our plan to bring our trees back? And I put together a great team with Confluence, which is a um, landscape architecture firm. And we created this plan called Relief Cedar Rapids. And I'm going to show it to you only because um, a third of what's in this plan pertains to Cedar Rapids. But two thirds of this plan is absolutely universal. And, and I, I encourage you, if you're doing anything to do with urban forestry, I encourage you, you can just go online and look at Relief, Google Relief Cedar Rapids, it's all very easy to see. Um, but a, a lot of new intelligence about what trees do, but, but also how to plant them. Um, but here's a typical park, here's a typical street before and after. Really devastating. Imagine, look at property value and property value. Um, it's a transect-based plan. Which I'll be talking about the transect in a minute. A key new urbanist tool for properly locating things in the environment. Um, there's a bunch of relief rules that I think apply to almost every city. A real focus on native trees. Non-native trees do not feed native animals. If you're concerned about the food web, which is crashing right now, uh, you need to plant native trees. Um, and also, a key thing that most urban foresters get wrong which is a misunderstanding of diversity. And an idea that every street has to be some tutti frutti potpourri of every possible tree in order to have diversity in your city. When the fellow named Santamore at the National Arboretum who wrote the 10-20-30 rule about species, genus, and family, he said, no, you achieve diversity by having localized consistency. And the healthiest way to distribute streets in a city, to distribute trees in a city, because trees of the same species support each other, is to collect them in groups. And most urban foresters nowadays fight that, and you have to tell them about it. If you Google beautiful tree-lined street, this is what you see, right? Absolute consistent species. So for placemaking, it's really important too. But it also helps with resilience. And then I think we made the most beautiful tree list you've ever seen. I don't know. But um, we, really tried to, we really tried to perfect the urban, um, urban forestry plans. And more and more cities are asking for urban forestry plans. Now let's talk about codes. Um, you know that they get thicker and thicker and harder and harder to, uh, to satisfy. This is the zoning code that I had to deal with when I was building my house in Washington, DC. Like most codes, it dealt with FAR, floor area ratio. Um, most codes have a lot of rules and a lot of data um, that, that, that surround a lot of data that don't impact what matters and what the code should be enforcing, which is how the private building creates the public realm, right? FAR is an absolutely mute piece of data when it comes to that factor. This is an FAR of 2.0. We call it the dingbat. It's the California apartment building over the parking lot. Horrible urbanism 2.0. This is a 2.0. This is an FAR 1.0, you know, the kind of environment you flee as soon as you shut your car off. This is a 1.0. This is a 0 0.75 FAR, we call the snout house model, um, 0 0.75 FAR. So FAR doesn't tell you very much at all. So how can we control zoning in a way that is going to make a difference? Um, you're probably aware, uh, it's faded because it's so old, you're probably aware of how one of the things that was done at the town of Seaside, which was the, the first real new urbanist community, um, was to create a one-page urban code. And it was organized by building type. We don't do it that way anymore. Um, but, but, you know, from loft building to row house to different types of, you know, to, to, to bungalow to, to mansion across the, the, the spectrum, um, Basically, each building was regulated in terms of 
where its yard goes, where its porches go, where its outbuildings can go, where its parking goes, and its height. Our codes now are a little more extensive. I'll show you what they look like, but they're now organized across the transect. Who here has learned much or heard much about the transect? Okay, just a few. The transect is, is something that's derived from, um, from ecology and the landscape. And it's actually a term that ecologists have been using for a long time. And it acknowledges the fact that when you take a slice through a large area, um, as you move through that area, the, the ecosystem changes. The flora and the fauna change. So you go from fish and water bugs up onto the beach with you know, crabs, and then you get up into the hill with raccoons, and everything changes um, as you move through it. And if you're going to create authentic urban environments, you can actually take that up the food chain into where humans live as well. And that was also done a long time ago with an acknowledgement that different professions find themselves in different locations on the landscape. And there's four main categories within a larger scale of from the most rural to the most urban. The four main categories are, uh, that are occupied are uh, suburban, um, urban general, urban center, and urban core. And each of those have different qualities. The streets become more curvilinear. As you go from urban to rural, the streets become more curvilinear. The sidewalks become smaller and might even disappear. The trees become less ordered and begin to clump together, and you probably get more of them. Um, the setbacks become deeper. The lights go from every 30 feet to perhaps just at intersections. And there's 10 other things I could tell you that change as you move through the transect. Universal Studios used to talk about making an immersive environment. What makes for a successful theme park? An immersive environment in which you're actually trans transported to a certain place in time. When our landscapes fail to do that, we actually don't feel as, as comfortable or happy in a place. And that's why the transect can be so important. And you can map different cities. This happens to be uh, New Orleans and Washington, D.C. and San Francisco across those four zones. Right? And the zones are more like each other than they are, you know, consistent, than there is consistency within the cities. And when you're actually doing a plan in an existing neighborhood, this happens to be the butternut neighborhood of Syracuse where we did a downtown plan, you can actually look at the historically inherited patterns and map the transect onto them. And that allows you to do zoning, <coughs> for example, unlike in so many cities where if there's a 15-foot standard setback, then the new buildings also have a 15-foot standard setback, which was not what the rules were in Syracuse when we arrived. <clears throat> then when we design new places, and this is a town called Providence in Huntsville, Alabama that's now largely complete. I had the pleasure of visiting just last year after 20 years. Um, you have the neighborhood, the urban core, which is the downtown, and then you have a series of neighborhoods, one there, one here, and one there, that each have their neighborhood center, and then you see the neighborhood general stuff, the urban general, and then you have the edge, which is suburban. There's a suburban neighbor, which is quite, quite suburban. And you know, to get your permits, you need to put like near like. So we made the edge quite suburban there as well. So this was our zoning diagram for, for building type. And from T3, these are called transect zones. T3, which is suburban, to T6, which is core, you then have commercial buildings, apartment buildings, live-work buildings, single-family attached, zero lot line, cottage, house, and villa. And you can see how they distribute from more to less urban across that scale. You have frontages, again, from most urban to most rural. Arcade, shop front, stoop, courtyard, forecourt, porch and fence, and common lawn that are, are appropriate. This is the private frontage. This is the public frontage. How deep is the sidewalk? How are the trees organized? How deep are the setbacks? Some people look at this and they think it has to be this um, gradual shift, right? You have to go through all the zones. But in fact, this is, this is actually T2. This is called, I didn't mention T1, which is rural preserve. Rural preserve. T2 is, is rural reserve, which has the hand of man, but is still kept natural. And then this, of course, is almost urban cores. Let's say it's T6 against T2, and you can slice it that close. You can organize anything 
<laughs> according to the transect, from sandals to loafers, I guess to the ultimately the tuxedo shoe. Um, this is Andres many years ago, Andres Duani at a charrette, or d proving his point. Dira Tadani made a bunch of these images: uh, the shoe transect, the automobile transect, the dog transect. Uh, the young men in the charrette did a Paris Hilton transect. The women fought back with a Brad Pitt transect. But you understand that it's, it's a great way when you're, when you're designing. Think about what zone you're in. Um, so that was the comfortable walk. Let me see how I'm doing for time. We have until 9.30? No, no, we have until 10. Great. So I have about a half an hour more, which is perfect. So now let's get into the interesting walk, which I talked about last night. And you know, you can have all the perfect ratios you want in the world, but if it's boring, people will also just turn around and choose to drive. That's where you say, blame the architects. Uh, and how you can hide buildings behind very thin crusts of residential. And the parking, the, the, the retail underneath is nice, but what we like to do instead these days, wherever we can, Ideally, about a 35 foot, so you can do a single loaded corridor, a 35 foot get setback with apartments uh, hiding the parking lot. Here's one that's retail with inherited Art Deco buildings in Miami Beach. Um, and I was joking that you guys do it, oh, sorry, where's, you guys uh, um, have every example um, of exposed parking deck and then a pretty cool attempt to hide the parking, not as good as real human habitation, but not too bad with the parking on the roof. And then your many streets that are a chal challenging the slot I had of Grand Rapids for boredom with the building that tries to be the parking garage. <laughs> <clears throat> and then what we do when we make new places, this isn't one of my projects, but it's a, it's a very elaborate example of what initially was called the Dallas Donut or the Texas Donut, where you have a block and you, you, you hide the parking in the middle and then you find ways to keep it a secret. This one I think is a rather expensive way to do it, but you get the idea. Um, and then surface parking lots, this is Celebration, Disney's town, right, in kind of a third generation new urbanist town um, in Orlando, but you notice if it's suburban and you're not going to structure the lot, you make a bigger block and then just hide the parking in the middle as well. But it's surface parking, not structured parking. And then, of course, blank walls and how art can make a really big difference, uh, whether American or European. Um, and you know, so many great examples. And you know, murals, urban murals are really so much better than they used to be. I passed. Was it here? No, I was in New York yesterday. Yeah, I was in New York yesterday. And I passed another mural where someone had let the kids paint the wall. And I'm sorry, I have kids, I love kids. Why would you let the least skilled people in your city create the look of your city? You know, you want professional artists doing murals, not children. And there's so much great stuff being done these days. Super graphics and um, really talented. There's no reason why you should have a mural that isn't surprising, breathtaking, conceptual art. Now, here's where I pick on, here's where I get Oedipal and kill my father. Um, one of my professors in architecture school was Rafael Manea, the, the Spanish architect who's such a wonderful man and great architect, great teacher. Um, but a lot of Europeans don't really understand that in America you can't do this, right? Blank walls are, are dead. And it's a beautiful building, but you know, I was in architecture school for, for four years and studied architecture before that. Um, and no one ever told me not to do this. Like they forget to teach you that. that actually, blank walls are bad. The, the guy who talks about it the best probably is, is Jan Gale. I don't know if you've read his books. He talks about sticky edges and thick edges. One of those terms is his and one is mine, but I forget which is which. <laughs> Sticky edges. Um, and what causes people to choose to occupy spaces? And you know, there's a psychology of humans that we understand. And blank walls just don't cut it. You know, 
two thirds to th about two thirds of Disney Hall in LA looks like this, not like what you always see. And you know, a a music hall which might not need to have access on every side or windows on every side can still be quite beautiful, even if it doesn't have windows. Um, you know, this is very few windows. This is Symphony Hall in Boston. And uh, it doesn't have to be traditional, which we'll talk about, but this idea of surface detail that gives interest to edges. And then Leon Creer <coughs> has this wonderful series of drawings. The point I want to communicate isn't traditional architecture good, modernism bad, but, but that you need detail. And I can say that one, if your goal is walkability, if your goal is having people out on the street, I can say with confidence, minimalism is bad. Minimalism is a style that many architects practice. It is not effective at creating walkable places. Leon Creer is this wonderful series of slides of a more traditional palazzo and a, you know, a flash cube or a Rubik's cube building. Um, and what happens as you get closer to it, are you rewarded, right? With the palazzo, you go from seeing a bunch of marks on a cube to a rusticated base, windows, roundels, windows, you see the edge of a cornice, nothing has changed on the right. You get even closer, still nothing has changed, and now you see the rafter tails and the framing of the windows and the window panes. You're rewarded by approaching the building, and that's what minimalism doesn't do. So you can do it with modernism quite easily, but you can't do it with minimalism. Davenport, Iowa, where my wife's from, decided they were going to become the next Bilbao. So we need to have a massive architectural competition international. We're going to get the best architect and put an incredible building on our downtown at great expense to the city, and it's going to bring us to life. But they made the mistake of, of hiring David Chipperfield, who did something that no one takes two looks at. It's, it's the opposite of a sticky edge, right? And, there, and, and basically, no trees are allowed around it. Um, the other thing, let's move beyond style. A more important thing that creates interest in streetscapes is many hands at play. And we have a problem today that impacts us both at the urban scale and at the building scale. And these are my clients. The, the infusions of capital are too big. So cities used, to cities used to develop over time, local architects slowly, each building kind of responding to the one next to it, maybe some evolution in materials. Um, <coughs> A lot of consistency, right? The, the heights are almost all the same. The width of the lot is pretty consistent. The agreement that there's um, you know, punch windows over more open ground floors. There's a ton of agreement here. But what makes it interesting, and actually what makes it feel authentic is the combination of all that agreement, but then in different hands. But these days, you know, I, I have a client that invests typically about 500 million at a time in different projects. I've got a $3 billion project in Tampa. I've got, I mean, this is normal. And they want it all built in five years. So how do you pull that off? And there's two main things to understand. One is to not allow architects to repeat buildings. And then to not allow buildings that are large to look large by breaking them up into smaller buildings. So I want to talk about those two things after I give us a tour of some nice little main streets that all share this concept of variety within consistency, which is what makes an authentic place. Now, of course, you're all aware of the, the modernist movement, which was extraordinarily optimistic and well-meaning, um, you know, replacing whole chunks of Paris with light and air, um, did not see, you know, they had the problem of large numbers, which we have now, right? We have a housing shortage in the US. We have a problem of large numbers, a lot of people to house. Should we allow it to destroy the environment? Uh, to be a place you no longer want to be, just to house all these people in what was seen as a miracle, which was all these identical places. Um, Peter Park, who used to be the Denver planning director, gave me this. But many cities, we have one in Boston, right? Many cities, this is Milwaukee, build stuff like this, where it's basically the same two buildings over and over again. And Peter says, Corbusier alert. <laughs> um, right, like Co-op City in New York, uh, similar to the one I showed you on the Lower East Side. Oh, we've learned not to do that anymore. They have we. So you've got Zaha in China and Stephen Hole in China. And when presented with a large site,
these architects feel an obligation to create a giant artwork. But that's the opposite of having a reason, an in, having interest as you move from building to building. This is another Zaha. Um, you know, it's just repetitive. When we do new towns like Rosemary Beach in Florida, we hand out the buildings actually to different architects and we insist. It's actually, this is the ideal because it's different, it's different developers. The best is to not let any developer have too much property. That's not practical in most of the places I work. So you ask developers to hire different architects or to be, if I'm going to be honest about it, you ask the architects to create different studios within their firm. Because the developer doesn't want to deal with multiple architecture firms. So we insist, create three studios and don't let them talk to each other and hand out the different buildings. Seaside, of course, you know, with you know, Dan Solomon and Machado Silvetti, a lot of really great architects creating variety around the town square. Um, they've been doing this at the same time in, in Europe, in Amsterdam and other places. Um, I think this is a little too much, <clears throat> but again, in the seaside model, these row homes were given to different architects to develop independently. It's certainly interesting. This is a project called Aqua that we developed, DPZ designed um, in Miami Beach, and we gave the, the larger, the taller buildings to three architects, Chatham, Spear, and Gorlin. They're called the Chatham, the Spear, and the Gorlin, which is fun if you're the architect. I stayed here just a few months ago in the apartment of Alex Gorlin. You walk in, there's a giant placemat that says Gorlin. You get in the elevator, it says Gorlin. I told him he needed one of those for his apartment. Um, but they named these after the architects, and then they hired seven different architects to do these different row houses um, that line the streets. You can say what you want about it. It's a little busy, but it's definitely not boring, and that attracts you to walk around. But some people don't really understand how this works. This happens to be in Carmel, Indiana, um, where it's, there's no clarity. There's, the, there's, the idea of breaking it down to smaller buildings has been botched, right? It's just a pastiche like you might find in a theme park, but a theme park would do better than this. You need to make the division lines clear. But it points to, and maybe you've seen, maybe you've seen these memes floating around. There's a new architecture style that's sweeping the nation, developer modernism, also known as beige box revival, earth tones and rectangles, and norm core. And I know that when I, you know, wherever I go in the US, there's a new project that looks like this um, somewhere. And they fundamentally misunderstand what it means to create variety by spreading the same variety across long blocks of buildings. And it's not broken down in any way that's, um, that's legible. It's just a lot of different pieces that actually when you're done, it just makes you feel like the building's even bigger than before because it hasn't been properly subdivided into what, and we call them demise lines. We put demise lines in our projects in the middle of blocks and say, if you build a building that's as big as this block, then it actually has to look like two buildings um, separated. So here's one, I had nothing to do with this. This is in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. It's one building, but they did a pretty good job of making it look like Three, one dead giveaway you have to be careful is the window right up against the edge, right? Each facade needs to be composed in a way where it would make sense as a standalone facade. And some projects do that better than others. Also in Portsmouth, New Hampshire is a more successful example, I would argue. Um, this is one building, but it clearly looks like three different buildings. Notice individual windows, double dormers, double windows, single dormers. Every aspect has a straight cornice, um, dentals on the cornice. So every aspect has to change, uh, you know, string course, no string course. If you, don't, if you don't try, you won't succeed, and a lot of architects don't try. This is um, City Place in West Palm Beach. Notice each facade is composed as its own thing. Uh, another view. Um, this is a David Baker project in uh, LA, I think, or San Francisco? San Francisco. San Francisco, yeah, San Francisco. One building, but he came to a few, we gave him some awards, he came to a few new urbanist conferences and went back home and he did this. Um, this is another Elkis Manfredi project in, um, in, in Somerville, Massachusetts. Um, one building. This facade could be a little more convincing, but you get the idea. And this is probably the best of the bunch. This is a Tordy, Tordy Gallus building 
in Washington, D.C. Tordy Gallus is absolutely masterful. Um, it's got the rhythm of the, of the context, and um, you know, even the cornice is completely variotous, and you, you really feel it when you walk by. So in my more recent book, Lockable City Rules, where every, it's 101 rules, one rule is break up big buildings, and it talks about how to properly do this. It says this, this work can be, it says, to coordinate many different architects, right? It's best if you coordinate many different architects. However, this work can be avoided if one architect can be found who possesses the rare skill of having different hands. In that regard, the burden of proof lies on the architect. Can she make different facades appear to be the work of different designers? If not, that's strike one, and the architect should be asked to distribute the facades to different designers within her firm who are asked to work independently. If that fails, strike two. There is no strike three. At this point, the architect must give up some or all of the job. <laughs> so here's a project that we're building. It's about to break ground. It was a 10-acre, 1,000-car parking, parking lot next to this train stop for the Green Line that goes into Boston. This is called Riverside. It's the end of one of the branches of the Green Line. Um, and you can see that this is one building. This is one building, but we have demise lines. And we have two different types of demise lines. We have the full demise line, which means it has to look like three buildings. And then we have the partial demise line, which is more of a pavilionizing or row house solution, where you're allowed to repeat, but each piece needs to feel independent. And so this is one building, and each one is its own look. And this is the pavilionized approach to create a rhythm and the row houses, which are actually one massive single-loaded apartment house that's hiding, hiding a parking deck. And we've changed the scheme now. This is all the same going. Th these were, this was parking above shops, but we managed to pull it back. And now we have a continuous edge on one side. And then I wanted to talk a bit about regionalism um, because it's one, you know, why travel? Right? Why go from place to place? More, more and more places in America are starting to look like every other place, with chain stores all being the same and architecture all being the same. Um, but you know, I come from the DPZ tradition where when we make a new town, we make it look like the place where it's from. So Kentlands in Washington looks like Georgetown because it's near Georgetown. Um, Loretto Bay in Baja, Mexico looks like Mexico because it's in Mexico. And actually, it uses the courtyard housing type of San Miguel de Allende, where every, every house surrounds its own courtyard. So it's not just style, it's urban form. Uh, Hulebrug, that's how you pronounce it in Belgium. Hulebrug, a project that I did with Leon Creer when I was at DPZ, uh, looks like Belgium. And this is. This adds to the value of these places. Florida looks like Florida, at least the way that Florida now looks around Seaside, which is slightly, slightly a fiction, but you get the idea. So that, that's it. I wanted to show you a couple projects. Um, this is a project I'm doing now in Salt Lake City. It's the largest TOD in, in Utah. Uh, there's the uh, light rail that travels from Salt Lake City down to Provo and stops at Vineyard on Utah Lake. And it's a former, it's the former largest steel plant uh, west of the um, Geneva Steel, the largest steel plant west of the Rockies, uh, which has been cleaned up. It's about 300 acres. Uh, and I inherited this plan, which was trying to be new urban. But actually, the train station is here. They put all the offices over here. Um, and you can see it was massively zoned. They created a street grid that wasn't too bad, but they basically put all the traffic on one street, so it had to be four to six lanes running through the center, undistributed, kind of wrecking that experience. And they, and they thought that a six-lane road would work with shops on it, which it might in downtown Salt Lake, but that's because people have no choice in downtown Salt Lake. Um, they had a mall, a pedestrian mall through the center that actually went over the road. I don't think shopping under that Green Mall was going to be a very pleasant experience. Anyway, a partial understanding of traditional urbanism. We came back and we did this plan. 
Um, it has large Utah-sized blocks, but every block is broken up into two or three separate blocks with pedestrian streets. And we're doing more and more plans with pedestrian streets. This is the view from the station. Obviously, this is town planning level architecture, so it's, 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 it's a holding pattern for what's going to come, but what's coming is going to look a lot like this. But a really key move was what I call a square about, which is that you have four lanes of traffic coming in and out because there's only one way in, but then we distribute it on this roundabout that takes the form of a square with stop signs at every corner, and no other street in the project has to be more than two lanes. Uh, then this is a look down that mall called the Promenade towards the lake, which is now integrated into the street network. And phase one, we're getting into tremendous detail of the urban design. Um, the driving block system, and then the pedestrian network in the center of each block. Uh, quite large, office and office and housing, and then the retail, basically the main street here from the station down to the, to the promenade. And thinking about how you frame civic buildings, the meeting house, right, the Mormon meeting house located at the end of the vistas in front of the, in front of the mountains. Um, so now we're, the architects are coming in and we're pushing it forward. Uh, but it's, it's, it's happening, it's funded. Uh, and then just to point out the little details matter, the way we're doing the bike lanes now, uh, out of the street even though they're quite calm, two-lane streets everywhere. So that's that. Um, because I think I have time, yeah, I still have 15 minutes. <clears throat> um, I'm going to show you some resources like I'm done, and then I'm going to show you the house I built in Washington, D.C. So um, uh, if you want to, if you haven't read any of my stuff, I would love it if you read this book, because it's the book that seems to create the most converts. But if you're trying to convince other people in cities to care about design, particularly at the urban scale, then this has been the gateway drug uh, for a lot of designers I know. Um, if you're doing the work yourself, which I think most of you are, this is actually the book I would rather that you, if you're going to get one book and you don't have, have them, um, this is the book that I'd like you to read because it's just step by step. You know, replace signals with always stops. And it gives you all the reasons, all the best arguments and techniques about how to do it. Um, but 101 spreads like this. Um, I didn't mention it today earlier. Chuck Marone is, is here. He's arriving this morning. Uh, if you have a chance, is it the same group seeing Chuck or is it a different group? It, it's a different group. So skip whatever's happening in your group. No, 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 no. no. There'll, be, there'll be tomorrow morning, there'll be opportunity. OK. Yeah. Tomorrow morning, attend your conference. But Chuck, Chuck is a wonderful thinker, one of our leading urban thinkers, but a super important book that just came out called Confessions of Recovering Engineer, which, which just shows that the emperor has no clothes when it comes to the way that highway designers are, are forcing us to live in dangerous cities for no good reason. Um, I mentioned Relief Cedar Rapids. You can Google it under that name. Uh, there's a TED Talk. Well, I look younger. There's a TED Talk, um, Why Walkability, under my name, S-P-E-C-K, that you can convince people why walkability is so important, which I didn't talk about at all during this visit. And then a separate one that is how to get it done, which is a very short version of the talk I gave last night. Um, and then I mentioned last night my Harvard class. You guys are prime. You get, you get your AIA credits. Um, you guys would be a prime audience for coming to Cambridge in June for two days, uh, two days of this, basically. And they're all, all those resources are at my website. But since you're architects, I almost never get to do this. Like, um, like never. Like, once. <laughs> and I'll show you, you can, it's also a TED Talk. <laughs> um, I had a really great experience training my whole life to become an architect not becoming a registered architect, but being able to do the occasional building, particularly when I'm paying for it. Um, and I've done maybe five buildings in my career. Only a couple turned out the way I really wanted, because if you're not the registered architect and you don't pay for it, you end up losing control of the building. But I did get to control my own house. And I got to DC, and I um, uh, really wanted to build a house that was, that was of 
Washington, D.C. And you know the plan of Washington, D.C. is rather unique. In fact, it was the first urban plan and still the main urban plan in the world that takes a gridiron and slashes it with diagonals. There were a number of plans that were principally diagonals, like you know around Versailles and that sort of thing. Um, and there are a number of plans that were just gridirons. You think about Paris, oh yeah, Hausmann is slashing diagonals through a medieval fabric. In fact, that was after this plan, considerably after uh, L'Enfant did this plan for DC. There was really nothing like this. And it's, if you read uh, urbanists talking about it, like Hegemann, um, it's extremely inefficient. It doesn't really speed up your paths through the city in any meaningful way. It makes for very different, difficult traffic patterns, and it makes for a lot of really difficult lots that are, that are flat iron lots. And certainly through the majority of the time since this was done until the present, it's only recently that that's been considered cool. It's only recently that we look at flat iron buildings and say, hey, that's neat. But if you look at the literature through the uh, 19th century, well into the 20th, people bemoan those sort of properties. But of course, like you probably, I thought the flat iron buildings were a very cool thing to do. And I went throughout the city in a zip car with my fiance um, to, from intersection to intersection just trying to find a little triangular lot that I could purchase. I almost got this one. But eventually uh, I got this one at the very tip of the L'Enfant plan. And uh, of course DC now continues quite a bit beyond this street. This is Florida Avenue. It used to be called Boundary, Boundary Street. Um, but this lot was available. It was actually two lots, 94 and 95, that added up to 540 square feet total. Wow. Now, that's a, not, that's a little deceiving because there was this ordinance in 1899 called the Parking Ordinance of DC where it meant parking as in turning the streets into parks. And they claimed everyone's front yard. So in fact, the property line is the frontage line. But with that constraint, it's a 540 square foot property. And I wanted to, and this is what it looked like. And you can see row houses on both sides, and then a party wall that's effectively um, V-shaped. And this property continues. So it's actually a symmetrical condition um, with a vortex at the bottom, like that, 34 degree angle. And so the question is, you know, well, first of all, the code, it was, it was pretty much illegal to build on. The, the code did not acknowledge that some lots had more than one front. And the floor area ratio requirements and other things, I had to get massive variances. But I was assured throughout the nine month process that I would succeed by people in the planning department because they wanted the lot to be built on. And I did eventually succeed. I had to throw out a parking requirement. I didn't want to park a car on the lot. Um, and uh, I didn't. But it took, it took eight, eight or nine months to get that done. Um, and this is the, I'll, I'll walk you through the plans, then I'll show you the house. The ground floor, I wasn't allowed to cantilever. So there's an entry and a stair in the corner, my, a bedroom, which became my office. And then what do you do with a wedge? Well, you make it a media room, and you put the, the screen on the door to the closet that's in the corner. And then you resolve it with this, with this wall, which makes it a symmetrical space. But the basic uh, partee of the house was a rectangle, a wood rectangle dropped in a brick triangle. Acknowledging that um, triangular spaces actually aren't very comfortable in rooms. Triangular public spaces are great, but triangular rooms, I don't know if you've spent much time in them, but they're, they're not particularly comfortable. Um, and uh, by dropping this rectangle with a, with a bay window um, into the triangle, I created a very normal uh, floor plate. <laughs> So I, st I studied under Scott Cohen at the GSD as well as Mineo, and um, he would always talk about um, multivalent readings, things that can be read as two different things at once, two opposite things. So one of the things I enjoy about this plan is that um, this feels like a bay window. Well, from the outside, it certainly looks like a bay window, and when you're in the room, it kind of feels like a bay window, but it also feels like the completion of the room. So what is it? Is it the completion of the room or is it a bay window? It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a multivalent uh, outcome. I also you know, read Colin Rowe and literal and phenomenal transparency and I was excited to have the visible rectangle punch through the house 
and then a hidden separate rectangle that only emerges, you only discover when you get out on the second balconies. On the second and third floor, there are balconies on this edge of the house. And this is all one space. The other funny thing, I love talking to architects, the other funny thing is that all the plans I developed had a stair in the middle. Because that's what you do with row houses. Why? Because when you land on the top floor, you need to be in the middle of the house so you can get to the bedroom in the front and the bedroom in the back. And I couldn't get a plan that was any good. I did a, I did a hundred plans. And my wife said, why don't you, who's not an architect, said, why don't you put the stair in the corner? And I'm like, well, that's dumb because then I won't be able to get to the middle of the house. But what I failed to realize was the house is so tiny that you can actually, you do land in the middle of the house, even though the stair's in the corner. And putting the stair in the corner was then what generated the partee of the rectangle dropped into the triangle ma that made everything work out. So you land upstairs, there's a hallway uh, that's also a walk-in closet. It has a, it has a curtain, so it functions like a closet, but it's the hallway. And you basically have a donut plan, master bedroom here with its own balcony, inline bathroom, and then a, a nursery, a smaller bedroom on this end. And that's the scheme. There's also a basement down below which is, I'm not showing you, but it's basically you go downstairs and there's a bedroom here uh, and then the rest is mechanical. But that's the whole plan. And um, these are the elevations. So it had a more public side where the entry was on Florida Avenue, which has a lot more traffic. Um, and it had a more private side on, um, on 10th Street facing west. And you can see how I took the vocabulary. Some people thought I renovated this part of it, um, but uh, I didn't. But I wanted to take the vocabulary of the uh, you know, I didn't go so far as to arch, to arch the brick, but I wanted it to be clearly of the same character as the houses that were coming up to it. And then on the more public street, I wanted it to be more clearly modern. And the public street was where the stair is, so that could have a lot of glass, and where the bay windows were punching out. Um, and it's really fun because you can, at night, you look in and you see this line of this bay window continuing in, uh, against the back of the stair, which is deep, it becomes deep in this space. So um, built some models. Getting through zoning, you know, was tricky. So I had to do every, use every trick I could. Um, and then this is what it looks like. I've, you've seen pictures of it already. <clears throat> had to cast a 34 degree brick for the corner, an L-shaped brick that we then wrote, alternated, right, building up the facade, <clears throat> and. Forgive, forgive the photo shoot. Um, this is the entry. Oh, and the, the roof, by the way, is a butterfly with its ridge right here. And it drains down this pipe, which runs through the house quite visibly um, through the whole thing. And then the stair is a big piece of steel. Um, oh, this is the media room I told you about. This is back when that was a big TV, but not anymore. <laughs> and notice the high, <clears throat> the high windows that continue the cut of the bay windows above them. The stair, um, here's the stair, and there's the edge of my office. Every space that's against the stair looks at the stair, either with glass or with an opening. So we were looking that way. There's my office with the glass up against the stair. And <clears throat> this is just one story of that stair, which was cast in three pieces in Minnesota by the Linder family, who came out in a truck and spent three weeks installing the stair in my house. The stair costs as much as my last property. Um, but that's what it looked like from the basement looking up the back. Uh, the architect, David Schwartz, actually told me the stair knows the stair is here. He told me to cut it back, which was very smart. So the stair cuts back here, <coughs> which, allows, which allows that view. Um, and then there's the bay window that's kind of a bay window and kind of just the, con the conclusion of the living room. It has a bench in it uh, built in. There's not a fireplace in the point, but a wood burning stove. And a really fun detail is this chase goes up into the master bedroom and, um, and heats. So it's not, it's a, it goes up into the master bedroom. I'll show it to you in a minute. And there's a window that allows you to heat the master bedroom from the heat radiating off the stove. And then um, you can see the kitchen, a simple U kitchen, and uh, the living room looking back at the stair. You get the idea. This stair in the corner, I always love stairs that can become other things besides stairs. So this stair extends an extra foot and becomes a shelf in the kitchen. Um, and then when you get upstairs, this is looking back. Master bedroom, back towards the nursery, through the bathroom. You can see the butterfly roof coming down to the ridge there. 
um, and then the view the other way. This window cranks open and gets a ton of heat when the wood burning stove is going. A lot of translucent glass to preserve privacy, although it's very light. The balcony on each level, big enough to, to, to eat on, two people to eat on uh, there. And that's the house. And you know, when you go to architecture school, they tell you, they don't tell you. The implication is you want to get on the cover of the magazine. So I've succeeded as an architect. <laughs> and we, used, we really had a lot of events there. And even though it was so small, um, we would easily get 30 people or so into the living room for, for social events. And this is the other TED Talk you can see. It's not, it's not well known because it didn't make it onto the TED website. But you can Google um, my name again and house TED Talk. And you can see that if, if you're curious to learn more. And that's everything. Thank you so much for your attention. And I'm exactly on time. So I have 15 minutes for Q&A. And you know, because you're architects, I wanted to have fun and show you my house. But that's really not my specialty. My specialty is the earlier stuff. And um, I would hope for maybe more questions about urbanism so I can be smarter than if it's about architecture. Yes? I have a question about, um, Mark, about, can you, st you're, you're also presenting. Do you guys know Mark Sofield? Stand up and wave at the crowd. Mark's also presenting. Mark was the town architect in Prospect, which was a DPZ project, one of the first to introduce really fun modern architecture into it. And that was largely uh, Mark's doing. Your question. Roundabouts and uh, traffic circles. Thank you. What town is that? Am he lives in Amherst, Mass, which I know rather well. So Says they've gone crazy for roundabouts. So, and the argument is that they're better for pedestrians. <clears throat> so are roundabouts good? Are they better for pedestrians? <clears throat> I work in Carmel, Indiana, as I mentioned, where there's 120 roundabouts. And Mayor Brainerd is a real um, hero for lots of things that he's done. We don't really see eye to eye on roundabouts. Roundabouts are safe. They, they say, you know, when there's a crash on a roundabout, you bring the tow truck and not the ambulance. Um, statistically, they've definitely proved themselves out. If you do a proper modern roundabout, not a rotary like we have in eastern New England where, you know, it's just a speedway in a circle. Um, but I rarely use them in my projects because they don't feel urban. I like to say that a roundabout is the most is the safest, most pedestrian friendly automotive environment that you can create. But it feels dynamic, doesn't feel static. And pedestrians are most comfortable, or shoppers or diners are most comfortable in static environments. And the, the place I know where, where they, I think they were misused was in downtown Sarasota, Florida, where they put a couple of them on their main street. And you see a couple of things. You see a ton of jaywalking through the middle of the roundabout, which isn't safe um, because it's just the most direct path. But, when you approach a roundabout, you have to go out of your way. And it's typically between 10 and 40 feet. You actually go, have to go off axis to cross to then get back on axis. So that's inconvenient to the pedestrian. But mostly, and even though it's safe and the cars are moving very slowly and everyone's looking at everyone, mostly, um, let me shut this off. Um, mostly, it's not good for a place where you want pe people to hang out. And I'd much prefer a, an always stop in that condition. There's one other argument against, that I didn't mention about against always stops, which is, and for roundabouts, which is they save fuel. And that's absolutely true. But they save fuel by creating an environment in which more people are likely to drive and less are likely to walk. And I think anything you can do that enhances walkability is ultimately going to save more fuel than people not having to stop at a, at a stop sign. Yes? Build two zones and parking to the back. And only one neighborhood really where it addresses the street section. Do you, do you think that's a good start for more walkable neighborhoods? Yeah, I mean, I think I think every city would be, would be better off with a form-based code than with a conventional data-based code or legalese-based code. Um, but you know, now everyone's doing them. Some are better than others. It's just a lot of work to to change your codes. One general piece of advice I have for communities often is to do it as an overlay. Like, 
because you often find it's impossible to change the codes because so many people are making their living off of the existing codes that um, eliminating the existing code um, and people are afraid that you're going to make their property worth less somehow. So you can actually, in some cases, keep the existing code in place, but allow, allow people to use this alternative as well. And I found that's a more effective way to do it. But a lot of cities now, hundreds of cities, hundreds of American cities, have replaced their codes with form-based codes in certain neighborhoods. And generally, it's, it's a better outcome. You know, Boston's a perfect example of, I mean, almost everywhere I've worked, it's so funny. Like, wherever I go to work, people load me up with all the, all the codes. And I immediately just put them away because I, was, I'm gonna I, I, I know your codes are bad and I'm going to propose something else. And I know you have a process called a PUD or something else where for exceptional design you allow us to break the code. And the developer's like, yeah, break the code. Um, <laughs> but that's how, that's how these days design is happening in American cities where um, it's just exception after exception and there's no predictability at all. And it's often a, an impediment to things getting built because it launches you into pub to a public process that ties you up for years. You eventually succeed and you make a ton of money after years. That Newton project I show you, showed you, we've been at it five, five years. It took us five years to get our permit, which we got, but five years. Um, so a better solution to spur growth in your city is to pre-permit stuff that's great so the variance process isn't necessary and that's hopefully what a form-based code is, is going to do for you. Yes? Um, what are your thoughts on more of a mixed-use building type halls with crowded downtown versus like focused offices side by side with focused apartments? So um, it's expensive to have offices and apartments in the same building because you typically have separate cores and separate entries and I've seen them, but typically there's not much of a benefit to doing that. And having mixed use side by side as opposed to vertically is almost as effective, maybe as effective as, you know, as one as the other. What the mixed use you really do need in a retail area is to make sure you have commercial on the ground floor. And then that requires certain fire protections and that sort of thing. Um, but beyond the ground floor commercial, in commercial areas, um, I think it's fine having residential, just be residential, office, just be office. The main thing I'll tell you is don't build any more office. Right? I mean, there, there's an absolute, I, I stressed this last night, I didn't this morning, there's an absolute shortage of housing in almost every downtown like yours. And you really felt it with COVID. You, you're feeling a lot better, I think probably because you guys just don't care as much, but... Um, <laughs> Like Des Moines feels like a neutron bomb hit it. Because so many of the people, you know, 90% of the people that were walking around Des Moines were office workers and then they got to stay home and, you know, at least a third of them are still at home and the downtown feels absolutely dead even though they put in 10,000 units of housing over the past decade or whatever they managed to accomplish. Um, that's on the edge of the heart of downtown. Um, but downtowns like yours um, would just come to life I'm sorry, you may not be from Billings proper, but downtowns like Billings would absolutely come to life with a few hundred, ideally at least a thousand. Um, but starting with a few hundred new, more units downtown, it'll be a different place. And there's ample space for it. Yes? So in Billings, we have a, an interesting confluence of transportation types, right? We still have a very <clears throat> active railroad that comes through the middle but freight only. Yes, exactly. And crossing that is, as you mentioned, the state managed, the DOT managed 27th, Montana first, that ostensibly is the evacuation route through town. What are some strategies? What are you evacuating from? Exactly what my question is. We had a tornado years ago, but that did You don't evacuate a tornado. Exactly. No. What are we evacuating from? But that's what at least I have heard from them. But what are some strategies that we can bring to these disparate parties that have their own agenda, that don't talk to each other, but affect our city, our yeah. town, our downtown, and that don't create overpasses to continue this flow through our city? So I've never had any luck wrangling a railway, because no one ever has. And that needs to come from like the federal government, which it won't come from, probably. And I don't know what to tell you about that. 
I can tell you that those cities like Tulsa that built overpasses over the railway wrecked the parts of their downtown around those overpasses, particularly with the rules these days about grade, limitations in grades and design speeds and all of that, 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 that you don't, you absolutely do not want to do that. I heard that there was some desire, but I didn't hear that there was any momentum towards that happening. Is there momentum towards that happening? There was a feasibility study that was done that might still be being evaluated. Right? Yeah. So you just have to fight that. Sure. I have no easy answer, but not many cities are building that kind of infrastructure these days. Hopefully the, um, you know, the current White House spending package doesn't include money for your overpass. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there's nothing good to be found in that. Yeah. Uh, getting to the interesting walk and to sort of zero into the details, um, when I go to downtown buildings uh, or communities across um, the country, really, the art of making a good sticky edge is sort of a lost art. Um, I mean, just how to design a storefront, people are putting reflective glass or, or uh, things like that. Are, are there some good resources um, for more de in depth, uh, just, just how to be a really good architect in terms of creating sticky edges? Uh, thoughts on that? So I'm not an expert on, because I work plan by plan, um, I'm not so much an expert on what are the, uh, I mean, hundreds have been written. The question is, weeding through the, the morass to find the design guidelines. I mean, it's actually, it's been a huge cash cow for architects, right, to write design guidelines for communities when there really should just be a couple that you could just photocopy. I mean, there's, there, there's some standard rules. Um, so I don't know, I don't know where to point you. I can't say, oh, the best one is blank. But I mean, if you look around, there's a hundred, there's a hundred good ones, but there's a few fundamental rules that you, that you already know, right? So if a, town does, if a town rules as a community that there will be no parking lots between a sidewalk and a front door, like there's no community, there's no community that shouldn't have that rule in place already now, right? No parking lots, no curb cuts, and no parking lots between sidewalks and front doors. That's number one. Number two, some, some communities have the rule. If you're CVS or whatever, or Rite Aid, the, the front windows need to remain vision glass. You can't put your shelves in the windows so that no one can see into the store. If you make that rule across your whole community, then everyone, you know, it isn't like there won't be a drugstore in Billings. So that's kind of the second rule. Third, as you mentioned, vision glass and not mirror glass. Certain, and by the way, I much prefer rules to guidelines because guidelines require a committee where rules require staff just to rubber stamp or not rubber stamp. Um, percentage of vision glass at the ground floor, you know, a certain minimum amount of opening at the ground floor, and then a really neat rule that I had to enforce upon our architects at Riverside, because they just, they just didn't do much retail, is, is every entry, actually to retail or residential, every entry directly on a sidewalk needs to set back from the sidewalk in some sort of alcove. And the alcove can be three feet by 20 feet, it can be six feet by six feet, it can be, you know, all different shapes and sizes. If you go down a traditional Main Street, like a, you know, pre-1950 Main Street, you'll find almost every door, and I was noticing here, the older buildings do it, and the newer buildings don't. Almost every door is set in. So when you open a door on the sidewalk, you don't slam it into someone's face, but also that's a, that's a sticky edge. That's a place to hang out. That's a place to, you know, to wait for someone and not feel that you're exposed. Um, and the, you know, the on gale thing, that's, that's where people are gonna gravitate. Um, so those are some of the rules, but literally it's like those rules and three more and you're done. So you don't need a whole guideline. I'm sure you're capable of writing that code. <laughs> yes? Um, I'm just curious, have you found any correlation with jaywalking having an impact, whether positive or negative, or So there are clearly dangerous places, particularly in the suburbs where the streets are highways, where um, you don't want to see jaywalking because the environment is never going to be walkable, and it's just dangerous. In more urban areas, in downtowns and main streets, you should have the sort of environment where everyone's jaywalking all the time. And I've never seen uh, success in jaywalking laws stopping jaywalking. Um, I have seen, and the data is very clear, that jaywalking laws are used in, uh, in a discriminatory way, um, in the same way that 
police pull over cars of people of color uh, to find out really you know, where the drugs are, because that's where they think they are, they, they, um, they write jaywalking tickets in order to frisk people and otherwise invade on their privacy. Um, jaywalking has a sordid history of racial profiling and other things. Um, and I found those arguments are effective in getting rid of it when you might otherwise have a public safety discussion. But yeah, I'm, I'm all for jaywalking. And, I, and when I, in Fort Lauderdale, people told me that they had hired me in part to stop jaywalking on their main street. And I'm like, well, you should fire me then, because I'm going to try to encourage more jaywalking. Is there a woman with a question? We want to be fair here. Speaking of, there aren't that many women, but is there a woman with a question? No pressure. OK. All right, the men are welcome to raise their hands again. Yes. Oh, wait, is there someone who has a question who hasn't asked a question yet? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, if you have a client that's worried about the streets, and specifically they don't want to walk a sign or like hide their building behind them, what's your approach? So there's clear data that um, shopping districts with um, trees generate more sales per square foot than those without trees. Um, the view of the sign is a legitimate concern. And I'm sorry to tell you the answer, but it's to get a tree that's tall enough to not block the sign. So it means investing a little more. Um, and the signs can be quite low. Another thing I didn't tell you, but um, I think it's in one of my books. With Andre Stuani once, uh, we were with the, a fellow who was hired by the largest real estate developer, commercial real estate developer in Australia to travel all the, great, all the great shopping streets and districts of the world. And he did that for two years. It was like a fellowship. And we asked him, Andres asked him, he said, what is, what's the most important, what are the most important things that you learn? What do these successful main streets share? And he said, awnings you can touch. That was his whole answer. But the idea of an awning at, at six and a half or seven feet, what it does is it's that sticky edge it makes you feel that you're kind of already in the, in the store. It shadows the window so you can see what's in the window. Um, but I think it's a great example of, um, of um, sticky edges. But also, it's below, you know, it's not that high. So if you advertise the store on the edge of the awning, then the tree doesn't have to be that tall to, to not block it. Yes, a woman. If I may be so bold today to identify your gender. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's what I've been trying to do my whole career, so I can't tell you. <laughs> but, but, you no, but I mean, the, the question is, you know, there's different issues. I'm always trying to disassociate driving speed from traffic, throughput from speed. Because you can have a massive throughput on a street and still have it be super safe. And you know, as you heard last night, I'm never trying to create, I'm, I, I never make a proposal unless there's a network where tra trips can be resolved on, on adjacent streets. I never create a proposal where I'm asking you to have a longer, harder commute. You know, I'm making it very clear that stop signs will get you through your downtown faster. Um, and that actually cars moving slowly through your downtown can get more cars through your downtown. So first of all, I don't create that opposition with the, with the automotive hordes against what I'm proposing. Secondly, I found that safety and the safety of children, that, that's what worked in Europe. You know, that's what, that's what worked in, they called it Kindermord, you know, death of children. There was a huge Kindermord campaign in the 70s in the Netherlands, which is what made them a truly Vision Zero country. You know, there are many large cities in the Netherlands that have zero traffic deaths now every year because they transform their street system around um, a lot of, ch it was like mothers against drunk drivers, but basically mothers against kids getting killed by cars. So I, th I think the safety arguments are very impactful. And then just making clear they understand that, that um, 
that a wide lane is actually an enticement to dangerous driving. And do we really want that in our, why, why shouldn't we, why can't we engineer our environment to match the speeds that we are posting? Right, what could be simpler than that? Yes? Um, when it comes to urban sprawl, um, I guess between downtown cores of cities and then suburbs, um, when we see how fast cities are growing, like that's at Austin with Google and Tesla hiring yep. 40,000 people in one year, have, have you seen or have you noticed a way to apply what you've learned from learning about the downtown cores to transition health Urban well, it kind of went the other way. Right? I mean, new urbanism started with these new towns, like Seaside, like Kentlands, like the ones I showed you. And it was, and that's why you know people give Seaside a hard time because it's a rich resort. It's become a rich resort community. But actually, Seaside taught a ton of cities to value urbanism again. People came from all over America, and they said, "Wow, this is great." I said, "Well, actually, the rules apply to your downtown too." So um, you're asking me to reverse it back. You know, what's frustrating to me is like every major city now, almost every major city, uh, has some sort of new urbanist development around it. Um, but it's still just one or two because developers have found that they can just keep on doing what they've always been doing and still sell it. So um, it sells for more, but it doesn't necessarily sell more. Just not of its, not of, so uh, clearly there's a model for creating new communities that are complete and walkable and diverse. Um, how to get more people to buy that model as developers is, has been very difficult. I should say that a lot of the work that we do about street safety is applicable to any, to any urban environment. And then in places like Austin, you know, I'm working in Austin doing a million dollar square foot development in Austin, just putting more uh, housing in new urban, not new urban, but new urban uh, settlements that are close in and very dense and tall um, absorbs, will absorb a lot of that growth. And, and most cities are trying to do that. How are we for time? Uh, yeah, maybe one more other question here. Last question. Is that here in Billings? That uh, urban investors are buying blocks that lie fallow? Um, from, sorry, foreign investors. Yeah, not here in Billings specifically. I know it's a big thing in New York and like other like large cities and states just as much in the real estate market. And uh, uh, so I was curious if you've ever run into that issue where there are these buildings that kind of create a vacuum. Well, I mean, um, you know, American investors have done the same thing also. Um, where, but, but right now, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of robber baron capital around the world that's trying to, to be placed in safe places. And you particularly see it on the coast. You see it in Vancouver. You see it in Seattle. You see it in New York City. These super talls in New York City, almost no one lives in them. They're basically safe deposit boxes in the sky is what they call them. Um, I think as, as, uh, as a city, there's only so much that you can do to stop that. Um, I think it's really important to identify, because I, I spoke two nights ago in, in, um, at the Arts Club in New York City, the National Arts Club, and of course people wanted to know my opinion on the super talls. And I said, first of all, you have to listen to my whole answer, because everyone was so angry about them. I said, I think they're beautiful. But uh, the fact is they're not really not benefiting anyone. Some of the arguments against them are red herrings, like, oh, the shadows that they cast. The shadow takes about one second to pass. Right, because they're so skinny. But, but in fact, they are um, not benefiting anyone. So the question is, um, the developers who are benefiting quite a bit, cities need to have rules that if people are essentially using your real estate as a place to store money, then the tax structure needs to be extremely beneficial to the city. So that, uh, yeah, these apartments in this tower or whatever the site may be um, can be empty for all these years, but we're going to get new streets built and new public works because of the revenue that, that we generate from allowing that to happen. But otherwise, I have no expertise in that. So let's end on my lack of knowledge. <laughs> um, so thank you all for, for coming and, and your questions.